Hi, readings from Catskill Caravan on this stormy summer night. We have a surprise for you tonight. We didn't mention before because I didn't know whether he was going to be able to be here or not. But we have one of your favorites, J.J. Clark, to read some of these poems tonight. J.J. Clark from West Hurling. Greetings. You came up among the uh, raindrops. So I did. And, and? I'm supposed to ask him why he doesn't wear socks of the same color. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, why haven't you been here for a long time? Because you haven't asked me. And so now I got smart and I asked him. I don't want to um, use much of JJ's time, but I did want to just make a couple of uh, quick remarks. Don't forget that we have um, a new issue of, of our Oxalis, and it's the issue that has all the prize winners in it, and JJ Clark is in it, of course, uh, with a wonderful poem, in fact, two poems. So anyway, remember to look for Oxalis, and now, we come to J.J. Clark, I'm just going to let him read and read, and once in a while I'll probably chortle or ask him a question about a poem, but otherwise, this is going to be his evening. What, is he start, what do you want to start with? Well, it's not as though I haven't thought about it. <laughs> well, this is one about um, when I was a boy and my father took us to see Houdini uh, when he was uh, down and out, actually. He was doing the Chinese water escape. I always remember it. He was quite a showman. When I was six, my father took us to the Roxy Theater on 18th Street, where Houdini was suspended upside down inside a chamber filled with water. You could see Houdini's face. His eyes were closed. The languid muscles in his chest began to ripple. Suddenly, his eyes went back, so only white was showing, and the audience went, ooh. And it seemed as though Houdini were possessed by some fresh entity. His mouth went wide, and then the languid muscles tightened one by one, and you saw his forearms move so quick that if you blinked, you would have missed it. And then the handcuffs drifted off, and then the leg irons, and the manacles. And then Houdini did a funny thing. He did a sort of deep knee bend, and suddenly this dripping little average-looking guy was standing on the stage, bow-legged, bowing with his splayed sandpiper's feet. Well, he clapped his hands three times, and from the wings, a high-class blonde came out and draped the cape around his shoulders and began to lead him off. He wasn't even breathing hard, and he left a trail of wet footprints where he had been. I would have given anything to shake his hand, but I was six, and all Houdini left behind for me were those wet footprints leading off stage right. I like to think sometimes you just kept going down the door and out down 18th Street with that big high rolling blonde plopping together wetly down the avenue and out of sight, escaping everything. Harry, I'm waiting by the door. And this next one is short. It's, uh, I sometimes think that all poems are about love, but I know this one is. Burned white by the bone-white stars, the raw breath blown out of me. My face turns up each night a pale, wandering melon in the moonlight, counting the pennies of the constellations. Nights I slot my long body in deep by the villainous ferns. The wild blood boils in my head. Come home. There's another short one. It had rained three days. I stood inside the house and watched how rain erases things, how the leaves go silver in the wind as though they had been rehearsing moves and turns for years, and the sudden sky, impossible with swallows after the white feast. A trellis of Jackson roses stands, crimson with guilt. They have stolen rain. I wait here, Mary, by the roses that have stolen rain. Those all seem to be love poems. You mean the love poem to Houdini? Oh, surely. Sometimes I think they all are. I was just thinking about what you said. This one I know is a love poem. When I was 14, not to be windy about it, but I had my heart broken. But before it was broken in twain, I used to wait for this girl. And she was like 14, too. I used to climb trees and watch her come home. <laughs> it's called Crouching in Birches. I could go mad watching the road, nothing ahead but one bent river of a silver where the moon stumbles among white birches with her one good eye. 
I could be home sleeping now, not here waiting among black branches where I have waited other nights for you, my warrior, my rose, crouched up here by the stars, your ape, your ape, your monkey boy. This is a little bit longer. Uh, this is about a guy who not only believes in reincarnation, but is reincarnated over and over again. He's a, 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 an oracle, a seer. And every time they find out they can really see the see, you know, futures, the big shots torture him, and you know he knows he's going to die in all kinds of gross ways. Look, look, the mouths of my wounds will close upon themselves before your very eyes as the moon climbs hungry over the swollen clouds, shrugging them off. Now, when I made maps, when I was younger casting charts and making prophecies, they brought me golden coins to crack my lips. They tortured me to read their foolish stars and count the houses of the moon. Nero himself came drunk and reeling to my dungeon on All Hallows' Eve. He held a rose in one hand, and he tapped my forehead with the rose, and he whispered, Tell me of my death. I saw it, but I shook my head. He slapped me with a bloody rose and nodded to his bully boys. All Hallow's Eve is now upon us once again, and the sour smell of someone tapping lightly, lightly with a bloody rose fills up my head. Now before, when I made maps, when I went casting charts and flinging prophecies about like golden coins, they came one night with hoods and flaming irons to torture me. They called me sorcerer and bid me raise the dead while I scrabbled on my hands and knees for hours speaking the seven sacred languages. But nothing worked. At last the hidden pentagrams and the seven minor tongues, but nothing stirred. They boiled me solemnly in oil the morning after. When I died, my eyes were fried into their sockets and my penis was a twig. Listen. The military smell of demons sits upon the wind, a hint of brimstone and desire. Now before, when I made maps, when I was younger, casting charts and making prophecies, they called me sorcerer and bid me nail, kneel for hours on nails with boulders on my back. Slick with a clotted resin on my bloody lips, rose spattered in that guttering light, I wailed and howled and died there finally at the reeking feet a good King Nero, sweet, drunken Nero. Or this is, I certainly think the title of this is better than the poem. But it it's about a guy, nobody I know, you understand, who feels that this, he's loved the same person. You know, different forms over and over again through his life. You know, they just keep coming back, some are blonde, some are met. And uh, that's what this is about. The crotch-level Viking. <laughs> well, I found your note in a bottle bobbing off the pier at Montauk Point, and I've been looking for you ever since. Bar hopping my way from Singapore to the gates of Hercules. I've signed my paycheck over to the gypsies more than once, and I've paid in poppy seeds for the shaman boys to tell your hiding place, fleecing me with their stone white eyes. Well, your note said something, something, and then you wrote to whom it may concern. Sometimes you climb the mountain just to climb, and I, I knew exactly what you meant. Remember, I'd been to the mountaintop, so I went out looking for you where the California breakers smashed the coastline to a worried crisp. I yelled your name out over the English Channel where it touches just the very whitest cliffs your eyes would ever know. And I met a girl in Istanbul or Mozambique or somewhere garlicky <laughs> with a veil that covered everything, but at the same time, nothing. Well, she promised me my youth and other sweaty things, all for a dollar eighty-six I figured out on the International Exchange. And I, I'd look for you just lonely long enough, I thought. I carried that damn bottle and that sorry bottle note around with me just one too many days. And I said, okay, and I went with her. Jesus, nobody sends out notes in bottles anymore. What ails you, woman? What is the song you sing whose words I know so well? 
Look out, I'm coming for you, lady in a bottle. Put on the dress you save for company. Board up the windows and the door. A rising wind has made Picasso madness of the sky. And I, I think of you. I think that you know why. Oh, don't stop now. That's great. Uh, that was a love poem. But what about that sorcerer? Was that a love poem? Um, nobody ever asked me that before. Uh, I don't know. I, I would say probably not. But, uh, That's wonderful. That's, uh, some of your poems are really almost dramatic monologues. Well, I like to cast myself in uh, the position of another person, like Julius Caesar or even somebody come and see how they might see them. Sometimes I like to cast myself as an animal. I don't have it, but I wrote a poem on a, a rabbit fox, which is not a new thing. But you know, it's through the eyes of the fox as it went out, mated, and caught rabies from its rabbit, rabbit mate. Sorry, I said that. <laughs> um, but this is about my father, who was a whole bunch of things. And he wasn't a good prize fighter, but he fought for a while. And we, we, my wife and I kept him for a long time. And he was really, really old and decrepit in his 80s. And he'd wander off and forget where he was. You know. And this is my first wife, the gentle one. She would go down and find him where he was stuck in trees or briars. Someone comes stumbling out of the woodwork each night after the moths have gone. Somebody banged up good, slammed by bells there at the end. A middleweight shambling through silent rooms, rum clutched in his hands of ruin. How we would find him afterwards, trapped in briars behind the house, weeping from thorns where winter had caught him and whipped him. And come along, champ, you would say, you old champ, and then stumble him up from briars into a dark old house. Oh, stay in your dark house, father. And when we find our evening voices, we will call you up from thorns. That's, uh, that's one uh, that I recognize. That's one of my favorites. When did you write that? Mm. Maybe four years ago, John. Mm. This one is uh, a little bit longer, I hope. It's not offending the audience in any way. I would have known. <laughs> But this is about a guy who spent 75 years on the ocean. He's just a seaman, you know, it's just what he does. You know. So it's kind of a recounting of his life. But I also have been reading Dylan Thomas, in case you didn't know, Coffin Rhythms. I am. The ocean roar of August whips my dark fisherman's face. Seabirds turn south again in the high tide sky, flinging themselves at the tunnels of wind. Black strings of seaweed drift on the tired sea. My mother kept a boarding house in Boston Harbor up until the war. She used to beat me bloody every time my father put to sea. When I was ten, she hung me out on a kipper bush to dry by my thumbs. Her drunk and calling out for Jesus ninety times. Well, the strap fell ninety times on my open back. Well, I stole out late that night for good, and I signed on as a devil's boy on the ship Bel Air. Three nights out of Boston, and the cook says, Meat tonight, my boys, eat hearty. Well, worms was the only meat they served in the good Bel Air. Mm. We finally dropped three iron ladies off the coast of Portugal, where the girls had teeth the color of trees, and the men sat around like coiled stones. We ate green turtle that night on the beach, tearing the maggoty flesh with our hands, and the firelight sang in my bones like the sea. The years and the years gone faces blossom like gobbets of wind that come out of the west from nowhere to flatter a sail and to bloom. At 26, I took a cannibal's daughter from my bride. I waited one whole summer on the beach for her to turn 11. Three sons I gave her in a Christian name, and I whittled her teeth down flat. But I found me a thumb in the soup one night, and I drove her into the sea. She bobbed up happy as an apple for a while and then gone. My stubborn coffee children next thrashing the sea with their coffee thumbs. I prayed out loud that night. My night held the good book open to Leviticus. I even sang a long, low rock of ages up to the climbing moon. But the ocean did stay put. 
Not one came plunging back out of the surf. Not one. I buried that sweet lion Bible in the bloody knife, and I lit out for the nearest port of call, like a boy again with the blood not dry on his hands, and the birds in the night turning south in the sky, and the wind and the sand and the stars sang in my bones like the sea. No, that's the end, all right. I never heard the cannibal poem before. That's great. Um, well, I really get into the poems, you know. I, I spend a lot of time um, setting up around me the accoutrements for writing, whether it be my dogs or a cup of black coffee or a cigar or whatever. And I, I work hard on them. But who knows how they turn out? More? Yes, please. We have lots of time left. We have ten minutes left. So. This is called The Drunk Priest and the Guardian Goose. I don't know where the name this came from, but the picture I have, the inscape, if you will, is a priest who has a drinking problem, and he's got this rotten little church somewhere that nobody goes to, you know. And he goes up and he drinks the holy, the holy uh, burgundy, I guess it is. And one night, uh, for no good reason at all, this goose comes. You know, uh, animals sometimes imprint themselves on you for no reason. Cattle come out of the woods, and you know, be your cat. And the guy just just doesn't like it. the geese, you know, and he just doesn't like it. But he changes. You know, he changes when you're drunk. <laughs> it has rained all night again in another language as usual. All the knives of my eyes slice up the morning air. The sky, a map of someone's grief. The sun, a sorcerer made, and God, the moon. No one should have to travel in the rain alone, but this goose has. In the hours of stars, I wake, and I ladle hooch into my chalice, and I knock it back. My cassock winched up tight as tissue paper. My father's collar halfway off, my beads in shambles. And then someone comes waddling in on a frog's flat feet, cutting the lacerated air with honks and toots. And I, I never saw this goose before. Last night, I spilled some holy burgundy on him, and he took off. But he wandered back tonight through rain and wind and up the attic ladder to my chancel room. Another gangster in a bad felt hat, I thought, or an angry nanny with ceramic feet. I dried him with my robes of God and held him not too fierce. Your, your, the uh, persona that you take on seems so real and, and so strange at the same time. It's wonderful how you can do that. Well, sure, you know, I've been writing for a long, long time. And it's got to the point where I, I almost can't stop writing. I don't quite mean that the way it sounds, but I mean, it would be awkward for me the way a gardener we might look at a, a garden that needs work. And, you know, it'd be difficult not to go out and just pull a couple of weeds, you know move a stone or something. I, th I kind of think that's the way I am. But I don't know, you know. We all think we're neat. Deep down, I guess. Um, this is a poem about when I was in prison and uh, I was being transferred from one prison to Attica. And when I got to Attica, you know, they give jobs to everyone in prison. And there was a guy I'd known before in another prison named uh, Culhane. Frankie Culhane, and they had made him, because he was so good with trees, they made him the orchard master. As soon as he saw me, I could still see him bobbling through the woods. And uh, it reminded me of another time we had before. I rode in on a prison train out of Attica, common as any weed, broke. The mean little years of my life stretched out behind me like snapped off teeth. Behind the wall, September burned the hills up with her fiery hair. Even the prison orchard rang like a bell with apple sounds. Wine saps and Cortlands, redder and deeper red than all my sins together, far as you could see. And here comes old Culhane, the orchard master, wobbling on his long heron's legs among the randy apple trees, all beard and set down deep blue eyes, quick fingers babbling to each other, hey, hey, the apple man. There was a time before, something we used to tell, how we ran foot races Christmas Eve, drunk on mercurochrome and Applejack. 
and we ended up flat-footed in the snow, weaving like swans. We even laid out eight light bars of silent night to the spinster moon. She was the only maiden lady we could find, <laughs> high up in her midnight balcony, waiting with little hands in a wedding gown for love to come. And then somewhere up the valley to the west, an engineer pulled down his quill and left a long, low note where he had passed. We stood there underneath the moon until the song has died. Two drunken bridegrooms and a waiting bride. Got a little rhyme there at the end, in case you're <laughs> judging me. More? Yes, let's have some more. Let's have about three or four more. Uh, I, I, I want to tell you ahead of time about this one. I'm not this guy. I speak to you, microphone. I'm not this guy. This is about the, this is called the Axe Man. And I also don't mean to offend anybody. Here's a guy who uh, likes to watch women undress, and he's sitting in a park outside of a high-rise, and he's watching this particular woman. He watches her all night. He's trying to figure out how he can get up there. An astonishment of birds suddenly gripping the sky. The flint gray sleeping city, damaged by sunlight, shudders itself awake. I have been watching your window all night and touching myself. It is never enough. Your mincing tiny bedroom steps dance in my boiling brain. I could eat worms tonight, suck out the eyes of bats. I could make dripping red pictures with my axe. Madam, I could say loudly through the transom, Madam, I have a telegram for you. And you would fling wide the door and let me in, breathless and flat-eyed and not a messenger at all. And you, you think you'll be able to talk me out of everything, the games and the good fast dances. You think you will. I'm glad you're not the man. I'm glad you're not the man. No, I couldn't be that man. Here's a quick one about a... I hesitate to read this because I'm not sure that people understand it, but here's a guy who loved a girl since she was about 10, and, you know, he's about 40, and she marries other people and goes out with other guys, and he just breaks his heart, so he's, as usual, sitting outside her house at night. And she comes home, you know, the guy lets her off. When you were 12, they dressed you up as a flower for the school play. No one remembers how the sun fell on your hair that afternoon. It was a fire, a cavalcade, a sacrifice, a private ceremony. And I waited all night long outside your house in the rain again last night, moths slamming the street lights for love. And you came home late. See how the songs begin. They are all the songs we know. I think that one was published in Oxalis, among other places. Could well be. Um, one of the ones that we luckily got to publish. Oh, surely. This is about a girl, for a change of face. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> there is summer in her, they said, and enough sad fall to make a thundercloud a day, but no winter at all, and nothing as definite as spring as if these were her faults and not her constituents. So what do you do when the seasons in a woman just won't hold? Well, you carp and pick is what you do. Pick and carp. And now the seasons hold me up like old habits. It is impossible to die. You said you wanted to end with one. Yeah, well, I made a promise to a friend that I would read this. Oh, this is about, I have to set this up, but I'll do it quickly. Um, a father, no one you would know, has a retarded son and cared for him for many years. He was completely incontinent and you know, totally couldn't talk except a few little words. And the child dies at 12, and they, don't, they seal the room off, the parents. And after a year, he comes back, and this is a rumination room on his, uh, his son. The only thing I have of David is one white afternoon when he was eight and tried to say my name. He did it as a birthday gift for me, 
a thing made out of love, and yet it was an exercise in agony for him. His thickened tongue came creeping out to mash against his lips, and frightened eyes blinked endlessly. He finally whispered something deep and low into the pillow. It was really nothing like my name at all, and yet today, remembering it, I seem to hear that one word, Father ringing in my head. He whispered something to the fading afternoon, and I could see a kind of love behind his eyes that tried to move his lips and wrinkle them and say my name. My wife ran moaning from the room, her hands held tightly to her face. I stayed behind and watched his sausage fingers opening and closing uselessly. The tears of shame that crept like frightened insects from his eyes. The drooling smile that changed his face into an open wound. The vein that throbbed behind his ear like music swelling to a deep and constant theme. The widening stain upon the mattress where the bladder of his effort and his love had overflowed. The clothes, the toys, the furniture my wife has tied in bundles for the poor. In parts of this gray city there are those who live on things that others throw away, who clothe themselves in rags. My wife has always smiled to know that David's clothes are worn and used and washed and laid to dry by children who have been without so long that something old is often something very fine to them. A pair of sneakers with a running boy inside them is a total living thing. The insteps mold and change to fit the feet. They fuse the rubber and the flesh until the act of shedding them at night is like an act of mutilation. On a winter's night a million years ago, my David woke from blood-red dreams afraid and touched along the darkened hall into our bedroom. And he stood there blinking, blinking, pointing to his tears as though he had just found them for the first time with his fingers in the dark as though he were the only one in all the world who ever woke at night afraid. He stood there moaning, moaning, while the wind went moaning, moaning through the lonely winter night outside. I walked him back through dark and darkness to his lonely room upstairs and knelt beside his rumpled crib, hand in hand like quiet lovers, till the wind outside would let him sleep. I kneel again beside his crib tonight, but all the things that told the story of his life are gone. His toys and his misshapen works of clay are packed and stored away, and it is wintertime again, and the darkness taps for David on the window pane, but no one answers. But great old friends they must have been, my David and the night, when aunts and uncles stood around his crib and pursed their lips like farmers gathered at a highway accident. That darkness where his fingers wormed along the edges of his crib and found each night a thousand different cracks and crevices to learn. And yet, I think that even if I could, I would not call him back tonight to see me standing here in darkness and in pain. For he would think that he had done some terrible wrong thing again. And tears would swim across his face into the corners of his mouth like tiny crystal minnows running to the sea. Some minnows always make it to the sea. In spite of all the traps of earth, the hawk, the snake, the fisherman, the strongest always manage to survive somehow. Perhaps they pray to all the proper gods. The weakest never pray at all. No one would listen, even if they screamed. I sign this love. Thank you. Thank you. We're very delighted, needless to say, that we have J.J. Clark tonight. We hope that you were watching out there and that you'll be watching next week for Catskill Caravan. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate it. Good night. <coughs>